Hello, so Daniel, also known as the Honest Techno Atheist, uh, his uh, channel is in the description down below, has asked me a bunch of questions about physics, and I'm going to do my best to answer them. Alright, so question one. What preceded the Big Bang? What caused it to occur? Did the expansion happen for a reason, or did nothing cause it? Well, to answer this question, think about what the Big Bang was, right? It's a birth of space-time, so whatever came before it has to be outside of space and outside of time. And in loop quantum gravity, we actually have something like this called the wave function of the universe. And so, uh, normally, you treat the wave function as though it's dependent on space and time, but the idea here is that you reverse the order of variable and function, and thus this wave function is actually outside of space-time. And this would be organized into a series of spin networks, which com would comprise spin foam, which is what you see here in the background. Now, what caused this to occur? Basically, the wave function of the universe underwent self-collapse in an event that uh, Stuart Hameroff and Paul Azizi referred to as the Big Wow. At which point, space-time, or what we think of as the physical universe, loaded up from that spin foam I referred to earlier. Did the expansion happen for a reason, or did nothing cause it? Well, the first place we got the idea that space-time was expanding actually came from Einstein's equations, and of course, he liked a static universe where everything was not moving, and so he tried to put a, a fudge factor in there to fix that, and then later on, Edwin Hubble discovered that the universe was redshifting, and so we can say that the universe is expanding because of Einstein's equations. However, he, Einstein's equations don't really say if it's going to be expanding or contracting, though, and so the question is, why is it expanding? So, the relatively recent development of the holographic universe gives us an idea about this. The holographic principle basically says that a region of space can be defined by the information content on its surface, and so that actually applies to the universe as a whole as well. But now the information content of a system is directly tied to its entropy, and so as we know, entropy always increases with time, and so therefore the information content of a system will always also increase with time. And since there's a direct relationship between the surface area of a region and its information content, as entropy increases, the surface area of that volume will also increase, and hence space-time will expand. So entropy is the cause of the expansion. Question 2. If the singularity was all the matter in the universe compacted in that, in that one point, then what made that matter exist, or did it always exist? Well, loop quantum gravity gives us the idea that space-time is actually emergent from underlying spin foam, and that would include everything within space-time as well, right? If you don't have matter, don't have spin, uh, sorry, space-time, you don't have matter either. So the matter did not always exist, and this is kind of good, actually, because otherwise we'd have an infinite density at the start point of the Big Bang, which would be really problematic. So then the next question, obviously, is how does this not violate conservation principles? The answer is that the net energy content of the universe is actually zero, and so, therefore, matter can actually fluctuate out of the zero-point field so long as you have an equal amount of negative energy that also appears with it. Question number three. If space and time came into existence at the Big Bang, then how could anything at all exist before then, since it would have no time or place to exist? Well, the thing here is that the notion that things have to exist in a time or a place is really kind of a construct of our intuitions or our, our language. So we think of existence as being inside time and space, and therefore, if something exists, we ask, when did it exist, or where did it exist? But that may not actually be the way reality actually functions. So reality isn't necessarily limited by our concepts of space and time. Now, a really neat example of something that actually does exist outside space-time that you can kind of think of if you understand relativity is the photon in its own reference frame. According to relativity, as something approaches the speed of light, it increases in time dilation and length contraction, and so something going at the speed of light, namely a light particle, will have an infinite amount of time dilation and an infinite amount of length contraction, and so it's going to be everywhere all at once and at all points in time all at once, but since time and space are what define differences between two locations or two points in time, then logically you can't really say that it exists in space or time. Now, according to us, it does, because we're not in its reference frame, but in its own reference frame, it's actually outside space and time. Question number four. What is the smallest unit of matter? Is it the quark, gluon, muon, etc.? Well, thus far from what we discovered, it would be the quark, but according to string theory, we have superstrings that would be much tinier than that, and uh, if you want to get really technical about it, we can see what the smallest possible space is to see what how small a particle could possibly be, even in theory. Of course, quantum gravity tells us that space is actually pixelated way down. It, there's the smallest possible space, you can't get smaller than that space. And that would be what's called the Planck length, which is 1.616 
times 10 to the negative 35th meters. In other words, a 60 billionth of a trillionth of a trillionth of a meter. It's really, really tiny. Question number five. If electrons, protons, and neutrons are made of quarks and gluons, then what makes up quarks and gluons? Uh, firstly, it's only actually protons and neutrons that are made of quarks and gluons. There is a theory that says that electrons are made of smaller particles called electrinos, but we don't know if those actually exist or not, so... Other than that, electrons may be fundamental. As for quarks and gluons, those may very well actually be fundamental as well. So, until we hear otherwise, it's entirely possible that, uh, you may not be able to break those apart into smaller particles. Question number six. What is the recipe for a neutron, for a proton, for an electron? Well, firstly, the electron may be fundamental, as I explained in uh, question number five. However, the neutron is made of one up quark and two down quarks, and the proton is made of two up quarks and one down quark. And uh, there's actually six different quarks overall that you can make particles out of. There's the up, the down, the strange, the charm, the top, and the bottom. And I'll give you a little chart here to show you different particles that are made of different combinations of quarks. And some of these are baryons, those are the ones that have three quarks, and then there are the mesons, which have a quark and an antiquark. So there's only two quarks there. And I'll give you a really cool link on that in the description below. Question number seven. If nothing can accelerate to the speed of light, then that means that things that go that speed don't have to accelerate, they just go that fast already. One example of this is radio waves. Why do they automatically go the speed of light? Are they just that fast? As it turns out, they are just that fast. Uh, they're defined that way by Maxwell's equations, which gives us a value for a wave velocity of 186,000 miles per second. And then they then discover that this velocity is the same as the speed of light, and from there they deduce that light is actually these electromagnetic waves that are defined in Maxwell's equations. Question number eight. I have heard that only things with no mass can go the speed of light though I would think that both light and radio waves would have mass, even if just a tiny bit, since they are both physical objects. So do they have mass then, or do they not? If they do have mass, then how come they go the speed of light? As it turns out, they do not actually have mass, and that explains why they can go the speed of light. Question number nine. Why does it take an infinite amount of energy to go the speed of light, when the speed of light is only a finite speed? I would think that it might take a lot of energy go to go the speed of light, but still a finite amount. It should only take an infinite amount of energy to go infinitely fast. Well, the reason for this is the mass increase laws in relativity, which give you an exponential curve the closer you get to the speed of light. So, say you go a certain amount of energy, you have a certain amount of energy, and you go a certain speed with that, and you can keep cranking the energy up and going faster and faster speeds, but then once you get close to the speed of light, it takes exponentially more energy to go just a tiny bit faster than the amount of speed before it, and so you never actually quite get to the speed of light. It just you get infinitesimally closer with higher and higher energies. And so once you get to the speed of light itself, the energy is actually infinite. Question number 10. Is faster than light travel possible? It would be needed to make traveling around the universe practical, and not just a little bit faster either, but much faster. Say, for example, a thousand times faster. Fast enough so that the trip to a galaxy a billion light years away would only take a few hours. Actually, general relativity says that it is possible. It's uh, allowed by something called the Alcabir metric, which is a specific solution to Einstein's equations, and the problem, though, is that you'd need negative energy to produce it. Now, we know that negative energy exists, we just don't know how to tap it. Uh, the other problem is that it would take the amount of time it would normally take to go to the speed of light to get there to warp the space to get there. So let's say you want to go to Alpha Centauri, which is 4.3 light years away. You'd have to sit your starship on the launch pad and warp the space for 4.3 years before you could suddenly take it across and go across in a single hour or whatever. Um, and so that would kind of stink because you couldn't use that for Star Trek-style warp drive, but you could still use that to get around the universe pretty fast. At least as long as you waited that long to get the space to warp. Now, there is an interesting possibility to organ warp all the space all at once uh, by manipulating the holographic nature of space-time, uh, in particular using exploding something called phase velocity. This would actually send a signal faster than light, but it would organize the space-time in front of the ship to warp all at once because it's defined by the same information. I actually have a, a video on this called uh, Warp Drives in Holographic Space-Time, and if this works, I don't know exactly how we get to pull, pull this off, but if it would work, you could actually travel around Star Trek style, in theory. 
Um, and uh, you wouldn't get you a thousand times faster than light, but the fastest phase velocities we've been able to produce are 300 times faster than light, and so that would still get you pretty fast. So it gets you to Alpha Centauri in about five days, and uh, Gliese 581G in about a month. So if you're curious about that, check out the video in the description below. Question number 11. What will the end of the universe be like, or will it end at all? If it does end, some possibilities are the Big Rip, the Big Crunch, and the Big Freeze. Um, now, let's see here. I'm not exactly certain. I think we can rule out the Big Crunch because it's going to keep expanding forever. The Big Rip is based on dark energy, which we now believe is a holographic effect. This is uh, Eric Verlin's work, and so it's not actually going to rip apart the way we thought it was because dark energy doesn't behave quite the way we think it should, and so the likely candidate is the Big Freeze but I'm not certain. I, the one thing I do know for certain, though, is that it should keep expanding unless something stops it. Question number 12. Does alien life exist? Is it intelligent? Will we ever make contact with them? How common is life in the universe? Okay, so let me break this apart. Uh, yes, I do believe alien life exists. I believe some of it is intelligent. And uh, will we ever make contact with them? I do not know, actually. And then how common is life in the universe? Well, this is an interesting question, actually. Um, we've been discovering recently with... Uh, you know, NASA studies of extrasolar planets that uh, Earth-like planets are actually quite common. They should be about, about a quarter of solar systems should have Earth-like planets in them, and um, it's not unlikely that these will be able to host life. And I also think that most of them will actually have life. I don't think that uh, life on Earth is some kind of freak accident that won't repeat elsewhere. And I also don't think that intelligent life is very rare. Uh, you know, we have we're actually the only intelligent species on our planet, but we have a lot of animals that are pretty close. Uh, African gray parrots, dogs, um, dolphins, for example, uh, velociraptors, theoretically, way back in the Cretaceous period. And so I don't think intelligent life is a freak accident either. We see evolution on Earth almost producing it several times, and so likely if there's evolution out there, it'll likely produce it a lot out there as well. And I'm guessing of the planets that have life on them, about half of them should have intelligent life. And I say about half because once you get to an intelligent uh, species, that species is not likely to wipe itself out. You know, Even if we had World War III today, you'd still have some people in some government bunker living underground and they would eventually start over later on. And so you can never actually wipe out an entire intelligent species. Now, of course, this raises the issue of the Fermi Paradox, which is, if there are so many of them, then why aren't we seeing any of them? And I actually have a interesting speculation on this, but I'm going to save that for a later video. I'll give you a hint, though, and I'm going to say that it has to do with what happens to a species when it undergoes uh, what Ray Kurzweil calls the technological singularity. Most of these species would have been around for millions of years already, and so they almost certainly would have undergone the technological singularity by now. And I have a theory that once an intelligent race becomes, say, a thousand years more advanced than us, that we wouldn't even recognize them as aliens anymore, even if we did see them. Remember, to a civilization a million years more advanced than us, something like Star Trek would be the Stone Age to them, which would neatly explain the Fermi Paradox and why we don't see aliens. So that's it for the questions, but before you guys go, I want to ask you a favor. I googled superstring code the, the other day, and my video came up all over the place in dozens of internet forums. And some of the comments were quite hilarious. Uh, the video I'm referring to, if you don't know, is uh, strange computer code discovered concealed in superstring equations. So I want to try a little social experiment. Uh, take that video and go on to, you know, three or four internet forums. You don't have to use your official name if you don't want to. And just post the video up and be real sensational about it. And I want to see if it suddenly takes off again and goes viral a second time. Make sure you read some of the comments on those forums. Uh, you'll get a real kick out of them. So anyway, I'm thinking of making this question and answer thing a uh, regular feature on my channel. So if you have any questions, just leave them in the comments below, and I will collect them and do my best to answer them in a second video. All right, that's it. See you guys.